Ladies and gentlemen, I'm pleased to greet you all in this happy morning in Indonesia, India, and Nepal, and happy afternoon, especially in the country of Australia today, which shows 1 p.m. Australian time. Today's public lecture is very extraordinary because our speaker today is from Brisbane, Australia. And I would like to welcome all of you to the public lecture that held by Tarakanita School of Communication and Secretary Studies, publicly known as Starkey. First of all, I could not emphasize enough on how honored I am to welcome every present students and lectures from Starkey, a keynote speaker, Pushpa Fagela, Women's, Men Women's Mentoring Foundation team, and all participants who are present in the Zoom meeting today. It's really great this public lecture is not attended only by the students and educators, but also professionals from Indonesia and outside of Indonesia, such as India, Nepal, and Australia. This is a collaboration event between Starkey Jakarta and Women's Mentoring Foundation, Brisbane, Australia, commemorating International Women's Day. We are glad to invite you to talk about how we can break the limit in a positive way by managing ourselves well. And how to manage it well, we surely have to understand on how to balance ourselves with a good emotional intelligence. My name is Jessica Lesna Sebayang. I'm majoring in Communication Science Study Program of Starkey. It is an awesome and precious change for me to be your Master of Ceremony in this morning on Saturday, 12 March 2022, in our big event, Public Lecture with the topic Emotional Intelligence. Before we start, I would like to remind all participants to open their cameras until the end of the event. Before we start our public lecture today, I will lead the prayer first. I will lead the prayer in Christian religion. Other participants, please be adjust. Let's pray together. Thank you, God, for your grace and blessings, because today we can gather at the Zoom meeting to attend a public lecture. Bless us for today's event so that it can run well without any obstacles. Hopefully, the material and knowledge that will be provided by our speaker can be useful for us and the people around us. And today's event can give us new insights. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, step on the following agenda. Our speeches. The first one is a welcoming speech from Mr. Wisnu Wirawan as the head of Communication Science Study Program of Starkey. Mr. Wisnu Wirawan, time is yours. Thank you, Jesse. Hi, everyone. Good morning, Indonesia, India, and also Nepal. And good morning. Um, good afternoon, Brisbane, Australia. Um, it's it is a great opportunity for Starkey, especially from Communication Science Study Program, to hold a public lecture commemorating International Women's Day on last March the 8th. And that's one of the women's colleges in Indonesia, Starkey concerns on how to develop and empower women, especially in educational field. The same mission on empowering women brings us together onto this event. We are very grateful to have Pushpa Fagela as the keynote speaker and team in Women's Mentoring Foundation Brisbane, Australia, to cooperate with us and support us in holding this public lecture. Because, yeah, we know that among the busy days and tight schedule, you can still take a spacious time for us sharing all with us. So on behalf of this institution, I would like to say thank you very much to all of you. Um, our appreciation also goes to students, lecturers, and all participants who are present here to attend this event. And amazingly, I see that the participants are not from Starkey and professionals in Jakarta, but also from other cities and countries, other countries, so wonderful. Um, thank you for... Um, yeah, Satya Wacana Christian University from Central Java. Thank you for coming. Indonesia Institute of Arts of Yogyakarta, Sahit University, Trisakti University, Paramadina University, Jakarta, and also Harapan Bangsa Institute of Technology, Bandung. And yeah, we also have some students, uh, senior high school students from Bintang Nusantara Vocational School. Hello, 
uh, uh, if I'm mistaken, Bintang Nusantara Vocational School is from Karanganyar, Central Java. And also some others from West Java, UDK8, Jatimulya, and also Dharma Putra Advance, Bekasi. And some professionals from offices in Indonesia and high appreciation to all fellows from other cities. Torrance University, Australia, Kathmandu University, Nepal, a Startup Business Academy, India, and also Charisma Coaching, Brisbane, Australia. Thank you very much. Uh, last but not least, Thank you to everyone who made this public lecture possible with all opinions, support, and also views, especially Clarencia, our alumna. Thank you for supporting us. And I think I do not have to spend more time delivering speech. Have a joyful public lecture with Starkey Jakarta and Women's Mentoring Foundation, Brisbane. Thank you. Okay, thank you for your welcoming speech, Mr. Wisnuwirawan. Now we move next to the but now we move to the next agenda. I would like to introduce Clarentia Winta as today's public lectures moderator. She is an alumna from Starkey, major in communication science study program that graduated in 2019. She is now held position in marketing communication consultant intern at Leadership by Design. She is one of the best students in our university who has participated in a photography competition held by one of the largest print media in Indonesia, that is Compass Indonesia. Received an appreciation and then had the opportunity to do an internship. She has also had the opportunity to participate in a winter English held by Starkey, collaboration with AIBP, Adelaide Institute of Business Technology Australia on August 2018. And now she's taking study masters in business administration at Torrance University, Brisbane, Australia. And she's here to represent Women's Mentoring Foundation. For Clara Diawinta, time is yours. Thank you, Jessica. Uh, this time I will be assisted by Chelsea as an operator. So yeah, my name is Clarencia Winta. You can call me Clarencia or Tia. Uh, for information to fill my spare time during the summer break, I applied for an internship uh, at Leadership by Design, uh, Brisbane as a marketing communication consultant under the direct supervision of Puspa Fagela. Uh, and then I just arranged University of Australia uh, in Adelaide, Brisbane to get my MBA degree. So today I will introduce Puspa Fagela and what is um, WMF and what does WMF do? Okay, next. Okay, okay. so PUSPA is an internationally uh, recognized expert in developing leaders, authors, and executive coaches in transformational leadership, business success, and holistic cultural change with over 40 years of experience. PUSPA has helped more than 100,000 leaders mm -hmm. arrive from all walks of life and professions before and during the, uh, um, the crisis to strengthen their leadership uh, capacities leading to outstanding outcomes. PUSPA has developed a shield of keynote uh, topics designed to assist leaders and organizations in increasing their innovation, um, innovation capacity by creating a culture of innovation and creative leadership. PUSPA's master was in accounting at <laughs> the University Law School London. However, her purpose and passion for helping and uh, inspiring people led her to uh, um, study ancient leadership wisdom, physiology, clinical neuro and hypnotherapy and attain expertise in cognitive behavior. PUSPA dedicatedly um, supports people in healing from hurt, distress, grief and traumas building their self-leadership through increased confidence, focus, and improved mental, uh, emotional, physical, spiritual, and social health. PUSPA's leadership development programs compels uh, corporate leaders and consumers to inspire, uh, challenge, and prepare organizations to live out uh, leadership and reach their potential. PUSPA and her team did tailored courses for business of all sizes and impact industries locally, nationally and globally. Next. Okay. 
uh, a go-to name for government departments, conference planners, multicultural and uh, corporate good organizations bring Puspa in as a female keynote speaker to help diligence uh, executives, leaders, and stakeholders. Puspa hopes to navigate change in culture where the participants take on a new perspective and make lasting behavioral changes. And as a qualified yoga and mental health specialist, Puspa really first workshop and specialized teaching to address mental health, emotional and social well-being in diverse um, uh, communities and cultures. Also, um, Puspa uh, provides her clients with simple yet powerful solutions that make uh, that take the complexity out of being an inspiring leader to impact their environment. As a coach, speaker, and growth leader, Puspa is on a mission to inspire, lead, and uh, inspire, lead, and transform uh, organization through their people. Okay, next. Yep. So, uh, Women's Mentoring and uh, Women's Mentoring Foundation and Leadership by Design are run by Puspa Fagela, located in Brisbane, Australia, and have been operating for almost three years. For your information, uh, Pus uh, Leadership by Design is a uh, new logo, if you can see the screen. That is our new logo for Leadership by Design. Okay, next. Yep. In any role, such as woman, mother, CEO, clinical neurotherapist, keynote speaker, author, Puspa embraces it with a um, sense of duty to bring out the greatness in others. Through her experiences, she relates to people's life journeys with a deeper understanding and wealth of wisdom. She was shocked and saddened to uh, witness several women who fell through the cracks because of these matters. Um, thus, it inspired her to start the Women's Mentoring Foundation charity with the tagline from hurting to healing. Her purpose is to become uh, strong in women's self-leadership, self-worth, and self-respect. Also, it's to help leaders from all walks of life, inspire them to transform their lives and compound this value act with others. The objective uh, is for women from all ages, diverse cultures, and professions to build up their ability to be confident, focused, physical health, to be proactive in their self uh, um, self leadership, and creating a better life personally and professionally in all areas of their uh, day to day living. Next. Next, okay. Uh, WMF aims to empower women experiencing pain and grief caused by various abuses, insecurity, uh, sexual, family violence, gender inequality, depression, stress, and uh, lack of safety and stability in their lives, including. Um, COVID-19 related concerns and then to assist women in finding their inner strength when they are at their most uh, vulnerable and struggling through the crisis. Uh, to assist women in regaining or building their confidence, trust and success through our mentoring, coaching, speaking events and online programs. Uh, furthermore, in our Hurting to Healing program, a four-week recovery program, we encourage recovery uh, uh, compassionately and respectfully over intervention support and bereavement counseling. We provide support through mediation and referrals to those experiencing to uh, pseudo crisis, emotional pain, and distress. And then we provide information and referral for women experiencing financial distress or, or uh, poverty, neglected by the system and exploited by other professionals such as lawyers, accountants, and et cetera. Next. Okay, uh, in addition, Uspa received high ratings for her speaking engagement for uh, several events. Uh, also, Puspa Award Outstanding Business of the Year in 2009 for Life and Business Coaching Industry, 
winner of the uh, winner of best new business in Northern Queensland, winner of the President's Award from the Multicultural Associations, recognized in the hospitality industry as one of top uh, seven Australian national finals out of 1,100. And recently, Puspa on becoming a 2022 India Australia Business and Community Alliance Award finalist across a highly contest category. And this is year uh, to uh, this is year to that Puspa Fagela. Uh, leadership by design has been selected to provide expert mentoring to women own and led startup as uh, part of the boosting female founders initiative next okay thank you for more information please call us or email us uh, don't forget to visit our website instagram and facebook thank you Okay, now, ladies and gentlemen, now we come to the main point of the of this webinar. Uh, we will discuss about emotional intelligence, which will be delivered by Puspa Fagela. So, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Puspa Fagela. Hello, Clarencia. Thank you so much for that huge introduction. Uh, so much more than you know I I I deserve. So thank you so much. I really appreciate that. And it's really a reflection of people like yourself and women of the world that inspires me to use the skills and qualities that. I have been blessed with that you have all been blessed with in order to make a difference to many lives and I truly believe that when you find your purpose you can you can do that so thank you so much I'm going to be sharing my screen and um, Mr Vishnu and the rest of the staff thank you thank you thank you thank you for giving me this opportunity to share somewhat some information and educational format that truly will make a difference to a lot of uh, a lot of our students and all the participants. I'd encourage you all to take notes because when we do take notes, it really integrates with our neural systems and we, we implement it easily. And another key skill of learning is write notes or learn as if you have to teach the content to somebody else. And then you unconsciously and consciously learn at a different level. It's not just a passing by theory that's there. It's like as if you've got to go and repeat this. So you learn with whole heart unconsciously at a deeper level. So I'll just share my screen. Um, bear with me one second. Can you see that, uh, Clarencia? Can you see that screen? Yes, 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 you can see the screen. Okay, I'll just uh, bear with me one second. I'll minimize that. All right, I can't see the screen, so just bear with me one second. I'm just going to stop share. I'll expand that, and then let me go ahead and share the screen. All right, can you see that now? Yep, yes. Beautiful, thank you. So, a Time magazine cover back in 1995 and hours of te television coverage introduced millions to EQ, i.e. emotional intelligence, your emotional quotient. And once people were exposed to it, they wanted to know more. What, what is this all about? They wanted to know how EQ worked and who had it. Most importantly, people wanted to know if they could work out how it impacted them and how would they refer it. So at that time, Time Magazine said, it was an emotional intelligence quotient or just EI, emotional intelligence. Then in 1990, psychologist Peter Salavoy and John Mayer published their landmark article, Emotional Intelligence, in the journal 
Imagination, Cognition and Personality. 1995, the concept of emotional intelligence is popularized after publication of psychologist and New York Times science writer Daniel Goleman's book, Emotional Intelligence, Why It Can Matter More Than Just IQ. And Daniel Goleman is the one that really introduced EI and EQ to the world. Um, so let's just turn that. Florencia is still seeing that, right? Yes. Beautiful. So what is EQ? And friends, you can actually participate in this um, throughout the session. You can, what you can do is ask the questions and Florencia will keep an eye out if there's anything that I need to know of or hear of during the session. And then if there are too many questions, what we can do is wait till the end and you can ask then. So the presentation is roughly about 45 minutes. So there will be plenty of time to have your answers. I mean, questions answered as well. So emotional intelligence is your ability to recognize and understand emotions in yourself and others and your ability to use this awareness to manage your behavior and relationships. Just uh, give me one second. So your ability to recognize and understand emotions in yourselves and others. Do many of you feel that that's easy to do? Are you really connected with you that you can actually identify the emotions that you're traveling through? If we think of ourselves as newborn babies, in reality, we weren't really born with emotions. And emotions come over time with living, with the role models that we have in our life, with the people that influence us. So how can you raise awareness for specific em emotions that you may be holding on to or living or experiences that could impact your behavior and your relationships with others? In fact, it's just not the relationship with others. We're also looking at your relationship with yourself. Emotions, yes. I mean, I can read the slides, which I will do. Re I will refer to them. The slides were really created for people that are visual. So we're very conscious of the fact that people learn differently, either through emotions, they learn through visuals, they learn through auditory, they learn through kinesthetically. And we wanted to ensure that we were meeting the needs of everybody here today. So emotions are involved in everything people do right now, especially when they're coming into their toddler stage, their teenage state, their adulthood, and definitely when they're studying at a deeper, higher level, just like many of you are. Every action and decision and judgment that you make is impacted by emotional driven impact within you and emotionally intelligent people recognize this that's not to say that we're not all intelligent we are but a lot of the emotionally intelligent people use their thinking to manage their emotions rather than being managed by them by themselves or allowing the emotions to manage them I did, a, I did a decision thinking webinar not so long ago in India, I think it was a couple of weeks ago, and it literally was on decision thinking. That arena was focused more on the corporate and the entrepreneurial side, is that when, are we do, when we do businesses, how can we integrate and implement decision thinking? Now, the base of decision thinking is emotional intelligence because it's all related to the emotions that we travel and more so recognizing and connecting with the emotions that others are traveling at the same time. 
So the emotional intelligence concept has become a crucial indicator of a person's knowledge, their skills, their ability to perform, whether it's at work, whether it's at school, whether it's at university, whether it's at home, in the home place with your parents or your family. And it plays a significant role in everything that you do. So how well you perform, how well are you inspired or motivated, and even how well you are focusing or being in the present moment. Because being present, being focused in the now takes energy. However, if we are connecting to emotions of the past, i.e. our transgressional journey, it truly impacts our ability in being present and focusing on what is happening in the right now, right this moment space. So successful management, um, Clarencia mentioned that I do a lot of leadership training. And yesterday I did a seminar on wealth management. People were talking about financial freedom. People were talking about how to grow businesses. For me, business is a spiritual game. And truly, if you are not deeply emotionally happy or satisfied, then your business doesn't really exist at a higher, deeper, in a fulfillment level. So I truly believe that everything we do in life has to come with deep inner fulfillment emotionally in a positive way. And the adverse is the same. So if you're in a negative emotion, the impact's going to be the same. In fact, when you're in a negative emotion, it really drains you three times as much energy than it would do if you were in a positive state. So if you think about it, it's using up three times energy, but it's also aging you three times faster. Now, I've been teaching yoga for over 30 years, and it's a fact that when you're calm, when you're in a good place, whatever you're thinking, whatever you're feeling, whatever you're hearing, whatever actions you're taking, uses up less energy than you would if you were in a negative emotional space. So what's the difference between intelligent quotient and emotional intelligence? I'm going to offer that to the floor. So if anybody wanted to share, please do so. If you want to make comments in the box, you can do as well. That's all good. And I'll let, uh, I'll let Clarencia, if Florentia, if you want to wait until the end, then that's fine as well. I don't mind waiting till the yes. end. Yes, uh, we will uh, wait until the end because we have a Q&A session after you deliver your material. Beautiful. Yep. Thank you. All right. So emotional intelligence is utilizing your emotions to determine the right response at the right time to the right people. So whoever's in front of you, how can you determine that you're going to be in the right frame of your feelings, your vision, so the person that's there, and it also impacts on how you build rapport. So whether it's with your teacher or whether it's with your brother, sister, or somebody on a professional level. And um, authors, the authors of the emotional intelligence said that when it first appeared to the masses in 1995, it served as the missing link in a peculiar finding. People with average IQ outperform those with the highest IQ 70% of the time. So when they have the high EQ and a average IQ, they were outperforming those that had 70% or above IQs, and it happened over 70% of the time. That's how they did the research. So the anom anomaly threw a massive wrench in the broadly held assumption that IQ was a sole source of success. Hence, EQ and IQ, when working together or in collaboration, can give you the strongest predictor of performance. Again, workplace, home place, wherever you're using it. 
90% of the top performers have high emotional intelligence and people with average IQs, like I mentioned, with the highest IQ, those with a high emotional intelligence performed much better. And that comes with decades of research. It's, it's evident now, many scientists have proven it, that high EQ is really relevant in where you are. And here's a further explanation for it. So IQ score is derived from your standardized test designed to measure intelligence. IQ relates to your intellectual ability. So how do you learn? How do you interpret information? How do you connect? How do you understand? And then how do you apply? Hence, when I say make your notes as if you're going to be teaching this to somebody else, that application in itself, as simple as it is, can really improve your ability to retain that information in your mind. And you'll also find that when you're sitting exams and that, if, if you write or revise, you'll find that the information that you've studied will come back to you more easily than it would if you were just listening or learning for the sake of learning to theory. And EQ, you can see, you know, the people that can manage their emotions and use their emotions to facilitate their decision making, their thinking, how to interact with people, truly gives them a higher ability in connecting, communicating, and definitely building that rapport with other people. So, Puspa, I've Puspa. already spoken. Sorry, on I, Puspa, hello, Puspa. Sorry, I interrupt you. Uh, can you raise your voice because your voice is so soft that it's not very audible. All right, bear Please. with me one second. Let me just increase my volume here. Is that better? Can you hear me now? Yes. How, uh, everyone, can you hear the post post voice now? Better, yes. but awesome. maybe. All right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for that. It's just that I can't see you all because I'm using double screens here and because I've got the PowerPoint up as well. So thank you for that. All right, so this is just a little historical side for you to read of your own. And you can see when we, you know, when emotional intelligence was seen as two separate narrow research domains, not that long ago, 1890 to 1969. And even at that time, they were focused more on IQ rather than the emotional intelligence side of things. And right through today, where there is still high activity in research for institutions that are studying worldwide on how we can uh, promote and increase the psychological testing of emotional intelligence. And then several of these have been publicized. So you might want to go and do some research on that if you really, you know, if you want to improve your education around this, because I, I believe that when we're educated or when we learn something for myself, I, would, I will never stop learning. And that's one of the five decisions I've made in my life is that I will continue learning until my last breath. And I truly believe as well is that that's where my emotional intelligence allows me to be connected to not only what I'm learning, but also what I'm displaying as a human being. And on that note, what in today's society, I think many of us are aware that human beings are truly living a life as a human doing, where the emotions are out of what they're doing. They're living life as if they're on an automotive mode, uh, automotive mode like a machine. They're just doing their daily tasks. They're performing daily. They're whatever they're doing. It's as if it's an automation without the emotions involved. A lot of people in this society have lost the ability to live as a human being, i.e. the lack of humility, the lack of respect, the lack of awareness. And it's not just for society in general, but they've actually lost that connection with themselves. 
And my friends, here's the thing. If you don't have that self-awareness, if you don't have that self-leadership or that self-love or the self-respect, even coming from a place of humility, it's very unlikely that you're going to be able to give that to somebody else. You cannot give to other people what you don't have or practice yourself. I hope that makes sense. It's not a criticism. It's a fact because if you don't have self-respect for yourself, it's difficult to share that with somebody else. Yeah, Bu. All right. Halo, Kak. Uh. Yang mau dibusak, yang orang rumah berbola. Everything okay? Tidak, uh, tidak. All right. So, I want to add a little bit of the component on intelligence here for leadership and just a simple arena of how it is essential if you're a leader. Now, we were all born as leaders, every single one of us. We're just born in our own unique style and have different abilities and skills in leadership role. So the component of emotional intelligence, the soft skills, i.e. the human skills in a leader is that at least two, it's, it's two times as much important for you as a leader that has influence with other people. And uh, it's two times as more important than just the technical side because you need the cognitive skills for jobs at all level and for when you're connecting with other people. So of all the people in leadership whose careers have derailed, you'll find that there, there has been a lack of connecting with other people or coming from a level of understanding where they've been in a leadership role, but it's they have pride, they have ego, but in a not so good way. Like pride and ego is not a bad thing as long as you're using it at a high level of integrity, honesty and recognition for your efforts and that. But three out of four are of those that derailed was because their EI was low and 90% of a success factor for any leader is determined by their academic stature or IQ and is based heavily on their EI. So perceiving emotions, understanding emotions, emotionally having intelligent communication and managing your emotions is a key element in any form of EQ or EI. And the question you have to ask yourself is that EI is not just about being nice. It's not just about suppressing your emotions and it's definitely not just about giving free reign to emotions or attempting to be a robot or being passive. And I come back to the robot again because that's where I'd even say 75% of the world are living automated lives, i.e. just human doings rather than being what we were actually created to be, which was an emotional human being that really connects with other people. And um, having reason without emotion is really neurologically impossible. So Dr. Damasio's answer to that question is that reason, be, having emotions without it being within our neurosystem is literally like living a life of somebody that is just not connected is literally detached from everything that's around them. And more importantly, they're detached from themselves. So as um, I know Dr. David Dornsip, he said in neuroscience, he's also a professor of psychology, philosophy and neurology at the University of Southern Queen, California, said that in his research on practical decision-making, he said that intimate connection between emotion and cognitive, i.e. your behavior, is an absolute must. 
So here are some examples for low emotional intelligence. And uh, again, without criticism or judgment, we all as human beings display both elements in our life. When we want high emotional intelligence, what we want to do is be consciously and unconsciously aware of what we are feeling. And it's like creating a new habitual pattern within us. Habitual patterns can take up to 21 days to 30 days to build right. So again, it's about being patient with yourself, having faith in yourself that you're looking to bring new habits in that will not only benefit you on an EI level, but also benefit those that you interact with, especially if you're a person of faith, because faith is somewhat blind faith, trusting in something that you don't yet see, but yet have enough faith to know that it still exists. So low emotional intelligence, you know, there's being aggressive, being demanding, having an e egotistical behavior or attitude or character towards others and towards yourself, being bossy and even being confrontational. I'll give you an example of something in on the confronting side is that if you're having a conversation with another person, instead of being present there, being focused and listening to the other person in your mind, you're already thinking of an answer or already being defensive. Now, I found that the most meaningful conversation as a counselor and even as a clinical neuropractitioner is that if I take a step back and how can I serve that individual individual better or the audience is better is to listen first. And even if it means that I take a pause before I answer, it's totally beneficial because you're going to meet their needs. You mm -hmm. meet their wants at another level. It's not that I haven't really even heard what they've completely said and I'm already conjuring up an answer to that. Uh, other low emotional intelligence, you've got a whole list there. You get easily distracted. I, I've done that myself. I, you know, if I'm supposed to be focusing on something, I might procrastinate. However, when I bring myself back to remembering how important it is, whatever I'm doing, I can then focus. Being selfish, being a poor listener, being impulsive resistance to change and we cover that a lot in our change management is that yeah people are resistance to change for example at Starkey they may change in the delivery of how they present your lectures or how they're going to be teaching you a curriculum and some students will be like oh no that that that's not going to happen or I'm never going to learn the same or that's going to be a bit of a challenge instead of being open to at least let's try it and taking it with a happy attitude that I may, I'm going to learn something different. I'm probably going to grow and develop in a different way and it's going to give me different skills as well. And uh, yeah, hard to please, being fussy. And I'm going to add a couple of my own personal ones there is being judgmental and opinionated. For me, with the work that I do and my purpose in helping other people live better quality lives, you know, at a highly EI level in a positive way, if I was to judge and opinionate them, if I would lose the ability to influence them as a leader. And as leaders, it's really important to remember that if you are judging somebody, if you are opinionating, then that thought stays in your mind, it's within your neurosystem, and it would definitely impact the way that you're going to address that person. And if you were there in the hope that you're going to help them, it's going to compromise that as well. So be conscious about the thoughts and the opinions you have of other people. It's to grow in EI. <laughs> Okay, so, uh, and then here are some examples of high emotional intelligence. Now, again, 
what I would suggest is uh, just write some of these thang, things down and do a comparison analysis. Uh, I believe, uh, Clarencia, I'm happy for you to share the slides with others uh, if they want to keep it for themselves and definitely, you know, use it as a learning curve. But do a risk analysis or uh, just a self-reflection. So when I do my self-reflection, at the end of the day, I do a reflection for two or three minutes. And if I don't get time during the day, I'll do it at the end of the week on Sunday. So I might do a 15 minute self-reflection. And what I'll do is I'll identify things that I've actually learned, things that I've absolutely loved. So for example, in today's training, what did I learn? What did I love? What are things that you know I could have done better while I was listening? How can I implement this in my life? And how can I, if given the opportunity, teach this or share this information with others? And on the other side of that self-reflection, I'll ask myself is that, was there something that I did that did not serve me? Was there some thought process? Was there some emotions? Was there some decisions or actions that I took during this week that did not serve me or serve the other person that I was with or the audiences that I was with? And what this does, it's, it's a really humble approach in just doing that evaluation for yourself, because I, you know, for me, humility is a must. I, I truly love being humble and I truly believe that everybody in this world can teach me something. I don't know everything. We're all made unique in ourselves. So even when we compare ourselves with others, competition is good, but do it in a good way where you're not bringing yourself down or bringing the other person down. Everybody has unique skills. I, you know, I constantly tell all my audiences that find role models where you would ideally like to have some of their skills and qualities. And it's not about copying, but it's about using the tools and resources that they have and then implementing that and integrating in a way that you can make it unique to yourself. When we go out to just copy other people, it's not us. So emotions are very important for yourself because, for example, somebody might be, I think many, um, Clarencia mentioned that I'm a trainer for Anthony Robbins. Now, Anthony Robbins, I've been with him for 17 years. He's very hyper, he's very active, truly comes, you know, just from his heart all the time. And there are some tools and resources I can use, but I cannot meet his energy because he's very energetic. However, some of these resources I can integrate in my life and then I can deliver in the way that Pushpa delivers, that's authentic and coming from a high level of integrity for her. All right, so here um, I spoke about the reflection and this is another tools and resources that you can use to increase that self-awareness. I emphasize on the self because you cannot give to other people what you don't have or what you're not practicing. And recognizing that, yes, I am in a good space or yes, I'm in a space that's not so great, but I wanna improve myself. So how can I do that? That comes with increasing your self-awareness, definitely doing the self-assessment, as I mentioned, and seeing where you are in your self-confidence. Now, human beings really live with six human needs. They need significance. All humans have these, these needs. They need significance. They need certainty, uncertainty. They need love and contribution. They need growth. They need variety. So recognizing out of these six human needs, what are the two human needs that you live in? For me, I definitely need certainty, yet I know I cannot have certainty all the time, but it is one of my top human needs. And my second human need is love and contribution because I love contributing and I love loving. I know that you know some of the seeds that I sow in this world are the, soul, are, are the seeds of love, hope, faith, 
evaluation and leadership. And, you know, if you can identify what your purpose is, that, you know, it will really, really benefit where you are in your EI and also in your IQ. In regards to the self-management, so if you were to find yourself that you're very, um, you react to other people when they're talking to you or you react to, for example, you get content for studies and your curriculum and automatic, you're like, oh, that's going to be so challenging. That's going to be really difficult to learn. Remember, your words are a reflection of your life. So it's important that you have self-control. And I'm just using words and the language that you use as an example. So where in your life do you need to integrate self-control in areas that, again, like behaviors, characteristics, attitudes that don't serve you? Having transparency, integrity, honest, trust. Like honesty for me is being honest to somebody where I've given them my word, I'm actually going to be doing something, I promise I'll go ahead and do that. And that grows on the trust. For myself as a leader, my integrity means that where I am in truth with myself. So if I've said to myself that I'm going to do this, I'm going to get this done, I'm going to have a rest today, do I actually implement those things? Am I being highly integral with myself as well? So that's where that comes for me as a leader. Achievement, adaptability, initiative, and optimism. And I love the initiative. So that's one question you could all ask yourself is that where is your intent in life? What initiatives drive you and your approach to EI, to IQ, and to everything that you do in life? One of the, um, the other things that I really share with my clients is that look at the elements of your body. Where are you in your brain? Like, what are you studying? What are you wanting to learn? What are you implementing? What are your thoughts processes? The second thing is being. Where are you in your environment? Identifying your love factor. How are you? We can't manage time. We've all got 24-7, right? It's what do you do in the time that you have? So the factor. Huh. Please let me know if I'm going too fast because I'm really passionate about this subject. And moving on to your social awareness. Empathy is a huge thing, especially for myself as a counselor. Because if I didn't have empathy for other people, I would find it very difficult to understand their situation. And especially in the Women's Mentoring Foundation, if I don't have the ability to have empathy, understanding, even sympathy, it's very difficult for me to deliver on the work that I do. Are you approachable? Are you a good listener? For example, a student might be going through some form of stress because there's exams coming or they've got an interview. Would you be a good listener just to listen instead of getting irritated or angry or avoiding them? And be honest with yourself. If you feel that I cannot at this time be the person that this person needs, then I, I won't go there. But if I know somebody else I may, I could either recommend or I could ask somebody else to support them. Uh, and that's something that I even do in my practices is that if I get a client in front of me and I believe, you know, they've come to me and say, Push, but this is the area that I need help in. Can you help me? If I truly in my heart believe that I cannot serve that person, I will do whatever I can to find somebody else than that could, but I would not betray them or lie to them and say, yes, I can especially if they're paying because that would be against everything that I believe. And I, I, you know, I think that they deserve to have, have the highest service available, not somebody that's just going to be there for the sake of being there. Now, relationship management, I mentioned earlier that we're all born leaders. We've all got leadership qualities just at different levels. And with leadership, 
everything that you want in leadership can be taught and it can be learned. So you may have skills and qualities that you need to just shine up and take it to another level, or there are areas of leadership. For example, one of the seventh elements that I teach in leadership is renunciation. Last year, I did a lot of training in the churches to the pastors and the ministers and on the missionaries and everything in the leadership that I taught was based on biblical principles. So there was always an element for me to learn to deliver at another level. We can all be coaches and mentor as long as you're coming from the right place in your heart. And we can all definitely be counselors if you have the willingness, as I mentioned, to listen, have empathy, and truly want to understand without judging and making opinions about the other person. Definitely not coming from a place of criticism. Again, EI is very important in teamwork. And if you don't have EI, your teamwork is gonna be a bit of a challenge where there will be conflicts. And what you're doing is making it more corporate without the EI. There was a research done by Harvard, I can't remember the year, but they the research was on who would prefer having men or women as leaders. And at that time, it was identified that people would rather have women in a leadership role because they came with a, you know, they came with a level of a deeper understanding, were willing to listen and also to consider whatever the teams were going through. Now there's an equal balance coming into that space because with everything that's happening around EI and the research and the studies, the, the gender equality is coming into space because now everybody wants to be living here and to be doing the best that they can, especially if they're an exceptional leader to deliver at the highest possible level. So a leader's intelligence has has to have a strong emotional component, as I said, and to have high levels of self-awareness, maturity, and self-control. So we've already spoken about EI. The reason I put this slide here is just for you to ask that question. Everything that we've learned here today, there's always gonna be another level of learning. So if you're making notes, put this question here and it's an opportunity for you to go and find out some more about what it is to think outside the box. Yes, Pushpa has taught us, Pushpa has um, shared a lot of information. However, for me, I want to find out what else is involved. How can I implement it in my level or at my, you know, at my stage, taking into consideration the person that I am right now in the emotions that I live with, with the intelligence that I live with and the interactions that I have for myself, within myself, but also with others. Emotional intelligence, leadership, and everything you do in life, everything that you desire in life comes from within. We've all been blessed with gifts and skills unique to us. They're already within us and it's about accessing them because over time, with the things that have happened in our life, with the emotions that we've gone through, we've stacked these within us. And sometimes it's all about just releasing them, maybe even doing a bit of journal writing so that all that's here, that's our natural abilities can be unleashed and we can start practicing and putting them into place. What you'll also find is that you have a deeper happiness when you have that breakthrough. It's like creating an aha moment for yourself. Here, so we're gonna go through a few of our summaries. I'll just check my time. EI is utilizing your emotions to determine the following. So a recap, your right response, your doing this in the right time when it's appropriate, not just as and when you want, and if it's with the right person. So people in front of you, but also having that quiet time with yourself. 
you know it could even be during prayer time whatever your values are whatever your beliefs are give yourself the gift of having some quiet time with yourself and working on the self reflections doing some journal writing revisiting everything that you've covered over the last 15 16 hours of your waking waking time in the day i've already covered that ei is not just about being nice and you know it's not just about pretending to be somebody that you're not because in this world again people live because or people express because they believe that's what the other people want to hear. For myself, I'm not here to impress any human being. I've, you know, being a person of faith, I've only got one person to impress. But I want to do the right thing by anybody that I cross paths with, and definitely as a human being. So I'm going to be sharing some tools and strategies for you that you can put into place. Definitely take notes for this. And it is about having a self-awareness strategy, doing your own strategic planning for your life so that you can be living life at a greater, deeper, and higher quality level. Observe the ripple effects from your emotion. So what I mean by that is that when we go through our emotions, there is a rippling effect, whether it's for us or whether it's with other people. If I was angry or irritable with somebody or with a group of people, that impact is going to have a rippling effect on them. If I was in a great space and I was happy and I was loving and I was laughing and I was joyful, that will also have a, have a rippling effect on the people that are around you and how they leave you. See, people aren't going to always remember what you've taught them or what you've shared with them or what you've done, but they will definitely remember how you made them feel. And this is a really crucial impact, um, important factor that we need to remember. People will always remember on an emotional level of how you made them feel. And it's usually that emotion that will trigger off everything else that you've shared with them. So visit your values. What are your values? I have, you know, integrity, trust as my top two values. Having strong leadership is another value. Humble, being, you know, having humility is really important. What are your values in life? And it might be worth doing a whole values exercise. Go and find what are the values that everybody else is practicing. Find a role model. What's, what are their top values? Do they relate to me? How do I want to live my life with my top values? Check yourself unconsciously, consciously being aware of where you are living. And what pushes your buttons? in that like what are the triggers in your life for example uh i know when i was at school there was this girl that would constantly be prodding me on the shoulder and every time she did that it would really irritate me because instead i'd just say tell me what you want instead of doing this and that was fine at school we were always the best of friends i was always there for her but that prodding really did irritate me Years going by, about 15, 20 years ago, I was with somebody in a classroom again. I was teaching this time. And one of the teachers, the trainers came up and she was doing this on my shoulder. And I just got really irritated. And that stopped me, you know, having developed on my spiritual life. I thought, why did that trigger? Why did that come up for me? And I realized it was that prodding, that physical impact that triggered that emotion. So Find out what pushes your button. What is it that makes you feel that you're in a great space? What is it that makes you feel that you're not in a great space? It could be emotions that you've atta uh, attached to things that have happened in the past. It could be the meanings that you've attached to that emotion. So we attach meaning to things that have happened in our life, right? Good or bad. Go back, do a transgression journey and think about what are the meanings that you've attached to events that have happened in your life. 
can you bring them back and change them so that it's a good emotion and it's not something that's going to trigger off negativity again because negativity uses more energy than a positive emotion would do and ask yourself why do you think why do you do the things that you do why do you make the decisions that you make why are you taking the actions that you're taking right now and more importantly seek constructive feedback i ask for my team for feedback all the time because i need to know what can i do better what am i doing great what else can improve we're all different i get teams all the time that are different and i want to ensure that i'm meeting their needs it's not about me and as leaders in life we have to remember that that if we're going to be working with somebody or delivering with people, for example, when I'm speaking, I don't want to be speaking about something that I want to speak on. I want to be speaking and connecting with the others on things that they need. How can I meet their needs? How can I meet their wants? And I want that feedback that will enable me to grow and develop so that I can ensure I am doing exactly that. This today, this program, this public lecture that we're doing, it's not about myself at all. It's about meeting you where you're at and how can I add value to your life so that you can grow and develop too. And here's your action plan. Just a few tips and resources that I'd love for you all to take on board and think about and you know, even add, add to it, add to your list. So pick an EI skill that you want to work on. For me, I know with um, losing focus was, for me, that's an emotional thing because I am a very focused person and I'm a very to-do person, person and an action taker. So if I lose time because I'm not focused or I'm procrastinating, that's huge for me. Before I used to attach guilt to it, and guilt is probably one of the worst emotions you could feel, as well as being envy and jealousy, three emotions that you should not be living in. So I, I did a review and I thought, well, why did I procrastinate? Was it because what I was focusing on, was it boring or was it something that I didn't want to do? And I changed it around. What I did was I asked myself the question, why is this so important that I have to focus on this right now? And I changed the meaning that I gave to the event that I was going to actually put into practice. And I changed the emotions to it as well, because how I changed the emotions, I started thinking about the outcome. If I focused on this task now, if I complete this task now, the emotions that are going to be attached is it's a self rewarding it's a satisfaction that I got this done and more so what will the other people benefit from if I deliver this and I got it done whilst being in a place of absolute focus. Pick on three strategies that you know you can start with don't overwhelm yourself with a lot of things. Yesterday, I was speaking to a team about having an action plan in place. What is it? What is the result that you want and why? What's the purpose? So when and I mean, well, human behavior or human mindset, we can't focus on everything in one go. So it's important to break it down in chunks and probably start with one and then two and then work on three. But don't overwhelm yourself with a lot of things in one go. Focus, pick the two or three chunks that you want to work on, get some feedback, give yourself some feedback, and then pick the next three. And then work with each other, find yourself a buddy, find somebody that you connect with well, or find somebody that you haven't spoken to before and ask them, would you like to buddy up with me, can we do an exercise together and hold each other accountable. Practice, 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 as I mentioned before, is the creation of new habitual patterns that could take anything from 21 to 30 days. 
So it's like being really unconsciously, consciously aware of where you are when you're creating this new habit. And like with faith, have patience with yourself. Trust yourself in doing and knowing that what you're doing is the right thing for you and for yourself in living the life that you desire and dream. Don't underestimate your ability to perform. Remember, nothing is perfect in this life. The lesson is that, yes, we will have failures. If there are no failures or mistakes, we limit our learning and growing. And some of the biggest, well, actually, most of the people that are successful in life are successful because of the number of failures they've had. They've learned, like when the light was created a thousand times before he got that one thousand and one breakthrough in creating that. Even with something like KFC, Colonel Saunders, how many times did he have to share that recipe with other people before somebody said, yes, let's do this? He never gave up. He was homeless. He was living in his car. This was the last thing he had in life. But he kept his emotions strong in faith and believing in what he had created. So measure your progress. Great for yourself, for you, and asking others to measure that with you. This is my final slide. This is my contact details, which I'm sure Clarencia will share with you and I just want to I'm just going to stop share here now so I can see you all okay thank you Pushpa for the uh, information and knowledge given to us may all of us um, get the value and benefits and it's useful for our uh, daily lives so ladies and gentlemen while the next one is a Q&A session uh, the participants who want to ask a question is invited to raise your hand and mention your name. Or for those of you who want uh, to ask, you can just write your name in the comments column. Then Jessica and I will call you to unmute your mic and talk very quickly. Okay, what? sorry for interrupting you, uh, Clarencia Winta. Mm -hmm. So before the question and answer session, uh, we have an important announcement to give to all participants. So after this, the committee will send an attendance link in the Zoom chat column, and all participants must fill out the attendance link. It should be noted that participants must write their full names because there will be a certificate of, for those of you who are present in the Zoom meeting today. And don't forget to include the correct email address because the e-certificate will be sent to the email address that you include in that link attendance. For your information, the e-certificate will be directly sent to you from Women's Mentoring Foundation, Brisbane, Australia. So ensure you fill in the evaluation and confirmation form correctly. Now we move to the question and answer sessions that will be lit again by Clarentia Winta. Clarentia Winta, time is yours. Thank you, Jessica. So uh, it looks like the first question came from uh, Mr. Jeremy. You can unmute your mic and then talk to Puspa directly. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. I personally would like to thank uh, Puspa here in this case. Yeah, your presentation is uh, enriched as you broaden my mind. Thanks a lot. Thanks. God bless you. God bless you. So, uh, shall I introduce myself? <laughs> well, my name is Jimmy. I'm teaching uh, public speaking and also speaking one, two, three, four. So, uh, my question is uh, as I know, my perceptions, okay, this is my perceptions that to measure someone's IQ is not as difficult to measure someone's. EQ, right? As we know, uh, someone's IQ, we can see from his report, okay? In schools, like, they have certificate. But how to measure someone who has good or high intelligence, uh, emotional intelligence? 
could you please share with us? Thank you for that um, question, Jimmy. A very, very profound question. And um, measuring measuring your emotions comes with practice, and you know, having that awareness. You'll also see that where people are very humble, kind, caring you'll pick up from them that their emotions are they're at a very high level because their energy, their presence, the way that they use their language and the words and just the actions they take, the decisions that take will reflect where that person is on an emotional level, building rapport. So visually their eye contact, where is their body? You know, how, how are they using their body language and more so the empathy side of things. So you know how I mentioned, are they willing to listen? Are they willing to you know, be there for you? Are they honest? Honesty is such an important thing when it comes to your emotions. Having worked with people now over five decades, their language patterns will tell me whether they're connected to their heart or not, or whether they're just coming from their head. And, and I mentioned that you know there's so many people out there uh, that are living robotic lives. They're just doing things on a robot way where there is no emotional connection. They may fe they may feel pain, of course. You know they may be hurt in some way. They may be joyous at some way or happy. But I believe that if we are individuals that connect with others we definitely be able to pick it up. And most importantly is to start with us, to be honest with ourselves. Where am I? Am I, you know, I, am I living in a space of happiness or even if I'm going through sadness, identifying that, yes, I am. If I'm going mm -hmm. through anger, then identifying that, yes, I am going through that. Many of us refuse to accept the fact that we have any negative form of emotion within us. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks for this, this open moment. Could, could, I, could I ask another question, please? Because it, uh, when you said you, you train uh, Christian leaders in your church, I'm happy to hear that. Yeah, I'm happy. So uh, which, which church do you go? May I know about that? So I was actually brought up in the church of England. Was is it um, Anglican? Yeah. Anglican. And then uh, over time, you know, the kids went to Catholic schools and that. So we, church became a huge thing for me. I disassociated myself with any specific church because then mm. it was just about delivering. And if I focus on, um, and I'll share this, excuse me, you know, if, if you're not believers of faith, is that when I was asked by the ministers, I was a minister at a church myself as well. Uh, when I was asked about training on leadership, well, when you think my leadership is based on biblical principles, I just adapted to the audience. So I was teaching leadership to Buddhism, I adapted to their needs. And last year when they asked me, can you, we, we are struggling coping with COVID. This is when it really happened is that our medical staff, our doctors, our politicians, our community leaders are struggling with coping with the pressure we're going through right now. Mm -hmm. And when I was invited to do it in the pastor's conference, Jesus was our greatest leader. Like whatever he did, obviously not in the first 30 years of his life, but when he came, he impacted the world in such a way with everything that he delivered. And he delivered to the secular world right? He came yeah, here to right. save people. Sure. And this is where yeah. leadership is. It's not that it's based on the church or it's based on something else. It truly is that how can I deliver that's going to benefit somebody else in some way? And education, we get it from all over. It's about us taking that education and knowledge and presenting it that it's going to benefit the other human being, whatever their background, their culture or their gender is. One last question, please. Puspa, so um, what do you think? Um, I mean, what are the most important, important aspects in Christian leadership? The most important aspects? 
aspect as in that what should we be implementing or integrating? Both, yeah. Like uh, implementing and also yeah. integrating. So one of um, the biggest aspect is be a good human being, be selfless, come from mm -hmm. a place of love, have respect for That's everybody. Right. Definitely be humble. You, humility is a leader's greater skill. And, you know, yes, we can have moments of pride of what we've done. We can have ego if it's in a good way. Don't come from a place of wanting to harm anybody in any shape or form. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, God bless you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jimmy. I hope my answer is appropriate. Uh, okay, I see for the second question from Flavia Nus. Please, can you unmute? Yep. Okay, uh, first of all, um, I know you said that you weren't trying to impress people, but um, I was impressed. Um, in matter of fact, um, I'm inspired by your speech. Um, I love how passionate you uh, you are when you, what is that, explain about the topic. Um, it helps us to understand better, in my opinion. Um, anyway, my question is, uh, so I'm a lecturer, and then when I'm talking in front of public or simply with friends, sometimes I get distracted with loud voices or loud noises, uh, sounds in general. Um, that obviously affects my uh, the quality of my interactions with people, um, especially when I'm teaching. Uh, previously, you mentioned that um, Getting distracted easily is one of the, what is that, signs of low EQ, what is that, low EQ. So I don't want that to, uh, what is that, keep happening to me. So do you have any tips or some practices that I can do to improve my focus? Thank you very much. You're welcome. So Flavianas, is that right? Flavianas? Yes, you can call me Fian. Okay, so what are what type of no noises trigger off? Some some loud noises like thunder, someone's drilling something, noises like that. Uh, those. And it's not loud noises coming from. Oh, people. not not from people. Uh, sorry. It's You're just right. like random voice. Uh, what's that sounds? Not voices. Okay, so when the when the noises happen, what's the emotion that you feel? Uh, uh, that's a very tough question. I never think about that actually. It's just bothersome, annoyed. Okay. Yeah. So that's the that's the emotion. See, there's an irritation. There's an annoyance there. Mm -hmm. Right, that's the emotion. So for yourself, my dear, what I would suggest is that, um, and this is this is what we call, you know, I spoke about the transgression journey or the transgenerational journey, is to, if you can at some point, do, do yourself a journal and try, well, not try, do, go back to the earliest moment in your life where you can actually remember when did, when did that start happening? When did I attach that emotion, that annoyance or irritation to the loud noise that got me distracted? Now, usually things, you know how I spoke about adding um, emotion and meaning to events that have happened to our life? Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. Only we can add the meaning to the events. Only we can add the meaning to the noise. Right? I see. Only we can add the emotion. However, there are times in, you know, things that happen in our life, like, you know, how I was talking about that prodding. I could easily have said, oh, you know, what, what, what would you like? What is it? But over time, it got annoying. It got irritated. And that was it. I didn't see her for 20, but I haven't seen her ever again. 
but somebody did that to me. And when they did that, I was like, well, what do you want? You know, and for me, that's unusual. I would never, ever, ever do that to anybody. So it surprised me. And, you know, I've, I've been in the neuro side for many, many years. And I thought, what triggered that? And I went back in time and I realized when I was in that basketball game playing with that girl and she was always doing that, that's what triggered it. So I've changed the meaning that if somebody does that to me, take a breath and ask them, how can I help you? Well, what can I do? But I will always take a pause. And that might be something that you might want to practice yourself that if that happens, what can I do? Take a pause, think about it so that I can stay focused in what I'm doing right now. If you can identify what triggers that though, that will be more power for you, for you to change the meaning and the emotions that you're giving to that. All right. Um, probably, uh, I will try that. Interesting. Um, but I've, do you agree that uh, we are the product of our childhood? I, I've heard that somewhere. We, in life, We've got role models, whether mm -hmm. it's parents, siblings, teachers, whatever. Mm -hmm. Everybody impacts our lives in some way. For some of us, like for me, my breakthrough came when I identified my own unique identity. And, um, you know, I've had many ups and downs in life. So I, from a very young age, I decided not to associate myself with anything that was a downer. And if I needed to cry, I'd go and cry, and then I'd come back. So don't deny yourself the healing process of what you're going through. Even if you go back and you do your transgression journey and you say, ah, it's because of that person, that's why I'm like this. Don't associate that, change it, that I'm glad that person gave me that experience that now I can change that reaction. And I can change my thought around this. Whatever you're changing, whether the past has been painful, traumatic, change the meaning that you've given that event. Be grateful and, you know, have gratitude that it gave you that experience, that today it's given you the learning curve so it's not impacting you in a, in a negative way. Negative association, that's when we talk about the cognitive behavioral association can be positive, it can be negative, it can be extreme. Even simple things like this, it, it affects our mind, right? So it's, it's impacting our mental health. And we've still got, there's still a huge stigma around mental health that these small things can impact us in a negative way. And it's the truth because that small thing I talked about stacking can lead mm -hmm. to another thing, can lead to another thing. And we are, we are associating it with the thing that's in front of and saying it's because of this when actually it's coming from something that's happened previously and it's got nothing to do with what's in front of us right now. Interesting. Thank you very much for your answer, Fuswa. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, uh, Flavia News, for your question. So uh, next question from Hannah. Okay, hello. Uh, hello, yes. Uh, thank you so much for your uh, materials. I really love it about emotional intelligence. So I want to ask, uh, I've read online that emotional intelligence is essential for good interpersonal communication. And some experts believe that this ability is more important in determining life success than IQ alone. So I want to ask about your opinion on this. Thank you. Okay. So can you just expand on that question? Uh, so sorry. Can you repeat it? You just expand a little bit further on the specifics. Okay. Uh, let's say some experts and people say that when you have emotional, when you have high emotional intelligence is... It's like uh, it can be it determining your success more than your IQ value. So, what do you think on it? Definitely, if you know, you can have a high IQ uh, and 
I mentioned in my slide, the people with a high IQ, they performed well, yes, but even with the people that had average IQ but had high emotional intelligence, performed better than those that just had a high IQ. Everything, even in like, uh, you know, I mentioned even in business, entrepreneurial, even in your jobs, it's successful, but everything is a spiritual journey for you because your spirit is within you. It's attached to your emotions. And if you attach your emotions to something that you're doing, it takes it to another level. So let me give you an example. Um, say I've got a job and I, I don't like going to the job. I detest going there. I'm constantly looking at my watch. When is the time going to go by so I can go home? Whereas that I absolutely love my job. I love meeting the people. I love doing the work and I get to work. And before I even know it, the day's over. And it's like, oh, I've got to go home. And if you, if you think about those two different levels, your performance with the first example is going to be totally different to your performance to the second level. Okay, that's really great. Thank you so much for answering my question. Thank you, Hannah. Thank you. Thank you, Hannah. Uh, next question from um, Berlianda. Please, can you unmute your microphone? Yep. Hi, Mrs. Puspa. Um, thank you so much for the presentation today. Um, I am Berlianda Ciputri. Um, people usually call me Alin and I am a sixth-term communication science student in Starkey. Uh, I would like to tell you my personal experience. So I was diagnosed with obsessive compulsive personality disorder by my therapist a long time ago. And that is I'm struggling with uh, things called control, controlling myself. So I would like to ask you how we train our brains to like difference between things that we can control and things that we cannot control. Um, because um, I usually have difficulties on that, especially when making a decision because my brains have this like cognitive error sometimes while making the decisions between um, things that I can control or not. And also I would like to ask about how we improve to be more assertive in maybe making, um, maybe working with people without um, feelings like, oh, I feel so bad for saying no or something like that. Okay, so thank you for that brilliant question. Thank you so much. The first part you said is, you know, that you can control and you can't control things that are happening is acceptance. So if we can accept that, yes, this is an area that is in my control or I can control how I attach emotion to it or I can't control what they're doing or what they're saying, is acceptance that, I think there's a prayer there as well, but learning to accept the things that I can't control, right? And once you have that acceptance, you'll see that you, you don't attach a negativity. You've got to first tell yourself, that is this situation in my control? No, it's not. And that's when you need to just touch yourself, pick yourself up at that point that if it's not in my control, how and what am I attaching to it? Am I attaching a negative meaning? Am I attaching a negative emotion to it? Am I getting upset because it's not in my control? Or am I accepting that it's not in my control and that's okay? Right? So outweigh what's the situation. And then if it's in your control, you know, you should also ask the question, okay, this situation is in my control and how can I address it so I do it in a positive, good way? Your mind doesn't know the difference between what's real and what's imaginary. So if you imagine yourself already that when things are not in my control, I will deal with it in a good, positive way, and I will accept that that's, that's okay, right? If I, um, for example, say you're watching a movie, and the movie's, you know, got some highs and 
blows emotional and somebody's crying in there and you'll be crying and you don't realize, you know, and you're, and you're sad or you're happy or you're laughing, your mind thinks it's real. So it's going through the emotion process, right? And in reality, when you can tell your mind that this is how it is, it takes the mind 15 minutes to resonate with what you're telling it. So tell it beforehand, I'm going into this situation. These are things I'm going to be grateful for because I can contribute to them. I can control them. However, this situation may not be, and I accept that that's what it is, and that's okay. Okay. And the second, the second part of your question was, sorry. Um, so the second question from me is that how we become more assertive maybe when working with people or maybe we in the leadership role, because sometimes when I want to be more assertive, I feel bad later because... Um, by saying no to other people like that. So how to improve without feeling guilty? Okay, uh, again, everybody should take the word guilt out of their vocabulary. Guilt, envy, jealousy, no go. And being more assertive, uh, again, it comes back to you connecting with the other person. How well do you have rapport with them? And um, it, it also comes from a place of trust. I mentioned that, you know, if I wanted to work with somebody and I knew I didn't have the skills or the ability to do that, I can say, look, I can't support you in this without feeling bad. However, let me see if I can find somebody else that can. Or knowing that the answer that I'm giving them is coming from, a, it's an honest answer and I'm doing the best that I can. And if it's a no go, then I'll walk away. So assertiveness truly comes with seeing where the other person is, that if I was to say no to them, how are they going to react? Then how can I, if they're going to react in a very bad you know, way or even defensive or get angry or hurt, how can I change my wording so it doesn't offend them or create that pain? So consciously being true to yourself and then also wanting to do right by the other person. So if, without saying, oh, no, I'm not going to do that. Oh, no, you know, forget that without being abrupt. How can you approach them where it's more humanistic? You know, that they will resonate with. And without feeling bad. Okay. Hey, um, thank you so much for answering my question. God bless. Thank you, Berlianda. So last question from Devika. Okay. Uh, thank you for this opportunity. My name is Devika and I'm second semester student in Starkey. Um, as we know, in Indonesia, we are still facing a pandemic, which makes the situation here a little different from before. And the pressure we feel is even heavier. And my question is, how do we maintain our emotional intelligence or keep our emotional intelligence and high emotional intelligence? Because for myself, sometimes I find it difficult to control my emotion because the pressure that I feel uh, becomes heavier in a pandemic situation like this. Thank you. Hi, Devika. So there's, there's a couple of ways that you can work with this. Uh, COVID has seen a lot of emotional uproar all across the world and countries don't even know what the impact's gonna be because I can tell you the breakdown hasn't even happened. It's gonna be huge. People are just coming to terms with what's happened. They've been impacted emotionally, mentally, socially, spiritually, physically in every way. And, um, here in Australia, the psychologists are overwhelmed. There are not enough people in the mental health arena to help other people. So if you can, uh, my dear, the first thing I'd suggest is that if you can support yourself, do, however, reach out to somebody else. It's really, really important. And this is what I've encouraged everybody. I've just finished six weeks training in Nepal, working with the medical staff there 
is that find somebody else that you can speak to. I spoke about the buddy system, finding a mentor, somebody you can talk to that this is what's going on. And what you'll find is that, um, so we, you know, we call this the higher intuition. We call this the communication. We call this the heart area, right? If this communication is closed, it's going to be very hard to connect with what your thoughts are thinking, thinking that it's real to what's going on in your heart. We want to open this. If, if you find that I can't deal with this on my own, I, you know, I'm finding it very hard to be expressive or to work through something, find somebody that you can talk to because what you'll find, and if, if you haven't got anybody to talk to, write it down because once it's out of your neural system, you'll get more clarity. We on average go through about 60,000 thoughts a day, right? Imagine all that going on in your head. And then you've got the emotions that are coming up. So it's just going to be, it's like a washing machine. You're just going round and round and round. Unleash it and release it, either through your journal writing, your self-reflection, speak to somebody. Because once it's out, you'll see it for what it is. You know, if I'm attaching a negative emotion to somebody's behavior and I can't understand why I'm doing it, if I've sp spoken to somebody about it or I write it down, and identify why am I doing this, um, that will help. If, if you don't even identify why, just taking it out of your system will help. And you can ask yourself the question, do I even want to be living in this space? Do I want to be feeling this emotion? Do I want to get rid of this emotion completely because it's making me tired, it's making me confused, it's hurting me, and I don't want to be in that space anymore. Okay, thank you for answering my question. Thank you, Devika. I hope that helped. Thank you, Devika. So does anyone else want to ask Puspa? No? Okay. Oh, the question <laughs> come from um, Ms. Gabriela. Thank you. Good morning, Ms. Panjela. <laughs> Uh, I'm interested when you mention about change, yeah. Uh, how related to regression, uh, what is it? Flip, yeah. We, we kind of like look back and then hopefully they will change our uh, maybe horizon in the future. Uh, my question is actually how big or how possible it is to have or to meet that change when we really can reflect or can go back, look back actually, yeah, and then reflect uh, how, how far, how big it is, uh, can change and influence our future. Thank you. Um, thank you, Gabriella, for that question. Great question. It can be as big or as small as you want it, right? So, you know, like I said, we attach the meaning and the emotions to events that have happened in our life. And for example, if, you know, if you've been to, if you were at school and a teacher wasn't very good with you, right? I don't know if I should use this example. <laughs> anyway, say a teacher's not been that great and you associated to going to school. I don't like going to school. You, you, you judge the whole school arena and education. I don't want to study anymore. I don't want to do this and it impacts your high school and it impacts your university because of that one experience, right? And your future studies. You go back in time and, and you think that, you know, why did that, why was that teacher like that? Why was he so abrupt or why was he always putting me down? And you can change it into many things. Like one thing with, with me and this, you know, it's a personal thing, but my um, we had a family member that was very critical all the time. Nothing was ever right, didn't matter how much we did, right? And always criticizing. And it was only after I started studying the neurological side of things and the brain waves and the interpretation and how our brain pathways work that I realized that that criticism was never about me. I was always thinking, oh, I'm so bad. I, I'm not good enough. I can't do enough. I, you know, I used to make myself feel sad in front of everybody else. I'd be happy, but in the corner, I'd go and cry and think, why, why 
why can't I do right by them? And I came to realize it was never about me. It was their own journey. It was just a habit they had. It was just the behavior they had. It's just the way that they were acting. They couldn't change it. And how I, how I perceived it was up to me. So if somebody was not being good with me, I can, you know, I can bring myself down and think that I'm a bad person. I'm not good enough. However, I can say that it's okay. I've done my best and, and that's it. I can't do anything more. And it comes back with the question that, you know, um, Devika and the other girls asked is that acceptance that I will do the best thing as a human being coming from a place of a high level of good emotional intelligence and do the right thing. But talking about the transgression journey is that if I held on to that pain, I would still be living it now. Every time I spoke to that person, it would trigger that I'm not good enough. I will never meet her needs. I, I should just stay quiet. I shouldn't say anything. Or I, I would be prepared that, oh, I'm, got, I'm going to face her and I will be preparing myself that it's going to be painful instead of thinking that that's okay. I'm going to love her unconditionally. I will respect her. I will do everything the best that I can, and that's all I can do. Thank you, Puspa, for encouraging me. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ms. Gabriela. So are there any more uh, queries? <clears throat> Okay, that's enough. Uh, okay, this is the end of the uh, Q&A session. Thanks to the participants that had participated actively. I hope you enjoyed and learned something new from this public lecture. Okay, so finally, I represent the Women's Mentoring Foundation team. From the deepest of my heart, I apologize for the mistakes that I have made as long as guiding you in this uh, webinar. Thank you very much for your kind attention. I return to Jessica as Master of Ceremony. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Clarentia Linda. And thank you for Ms. Pushpa for your answers. And thank you for Clarentia Linda for moderating our public lecture today. And also thank you for those of you for asking questions. From the materials that Ms. Pushpa gave to us and from the question and answers before, I hope we can understand and we can compare the difference between EI and IQ. And we know why emotional intelligence is important for us, especially in this pandemic era. And of course, we can do the analysis for ourselves or self-reflections like Ms. Pushpa said before that what emotional do you have right now? Do you show yourself in low emotional intelligence or in high emotional intelligence? And from what we get, we can do recognition and regulations, such as self-awareness, social awareness, self-management, and then relationship management. And we can observe ourselves and do the action plan that Ms. Pushpa gave to us before. Thank you once again to Ms. Pushpa. And now the question and answer session can be closed. And I want to remind all participants to fill in the attendance link listed in the Zoom chat column. And don't forget to write the correct email address because there will be an e-certificate that will be sent to your email. And then next, uh, yes, Ms. Pashpa. I just want to say uh, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. And more so thank you for all the blessings that you've been sending me in the chat. I've been watching that. So very, very grateful, thank you. Okay, thank you, Ms. Bashma. And next, we want to give token of appreciations, which will be delivered by Mr. Wisnu Wirawan. And we give this as a sign of our gratitude to Ms. Bashma and Women's Mentoring Foundation team as our keynote speaker for making their time to present in our public lecture today so that we can hand the certificate for Mr. Wisnu Wirawan. Time is yours. Yes, thank you very much, Jess. Um, yeah, with all materials given, I'm sure that this topic enlightens us, bringing all knowledge and also uh, hopefully it develops us more to be better and better for the future. Uh, we can see all the enthusiasm from participants during the Q uh, question and answer sessions and also the comments on chat box. So once again, on behalf of this institution, Starkey, uh, I would like to say thank you very much to all of you. 
Um, herewith, we send you virtual token of appreciation for you, Pushpa Fagela. Thank you so much, Mr. Vishnu, and thank you for having me. And the second one, um, for the Women's Mentoring Foundation. Thank you. Very, very great. Welcome. Thank you. thank you, Tia. Back to you, Jesse. Okay, thank you, Mr. Wisnuwirawan and Ms. Pushpa. And next, we want to give a token of appreciation to for Clarentia Winta, which will be delivered by Mrs. Yulita Daru. And we give this as a sign of our gratitude to Clarentia Winta as our moderator for public lecture today, so that we can have the certificate for Mrs. Yulita Daru. Time is yours. Thank you very much, Jessica. Clarentia, three years ago, you were one of my best students, but now I can say that you are my partner. <laughs> <laughs> we are very grateful for your support in our public lecture today. Okay. On behalf of our institution staff, your alma mater, we would like to express our appreciation and thanks yeah, that are symbolized by the certificate. Clarentia, we proudly present this certificate to you. Here you are. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Daru and Mr. Wisnu. This is real beyond all my expectation. <laughs> thank you so much. You're welcome. And thank you so much, Ms. Puspa, for your great lecture and sharing. Thanks. Okay. Yes, Jessica, would you please go on? Thank you, Mrs. Silita Daru and Clarendia Winta. Now we want to take a documentation. All participants, please open your cameras. And our documentation will be led by Maria Chelsea. Maria Chelsea, time is yours. Okay, everyone. Now I want to take a photo. Please uh, turn, uh, turn on the camera and get ready. Okay, slide one. One, two, three, smile. Okay, hold up, wait. Next slide, slide two. Okay, wait. Okay, one, two, three. Okay, wait. Okay, next slide, slide three. Okay, one, two, three. Okay, wait. Okay, next slide, slide four. Okay, one, two, three. Okay, wait. Okay, next slide, slide five. Okay, one, two, three. Okay, wait. Next slide, slide six. Okay, one, two, three. Okay, wait. Okay, next slide, slide seven. Okay, one, two, three. Okay. Okay, next slide, slide eight until 11, please turn on the camera. Okay, it's okay, okay. One, two, three. Okay, next slide. One, two, three. Okay. Okay, done. Okay, thank you, Maria Chelsea, for taking our documentation. And before we end our public lecture today, I will lead the closing prayer in Christian religion. Other participants, please be at chest. Let's pray together. Thank you, God, for because of your love and grace. 
today's public lecture can be carried out well and smoothly. Thank you for the amazing speakers who have delivered the materials well. Thank you for the opportunity that has been given to us so we can get the knowledge and insights. God, please bless our speakers, lecturers, students, committee members, and all participants who attended this Zoom meeting today. Once again, we give thanks to God for today. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, today's public lecture is over. Once again, I want to remind all participants to fill in the attendance link listed in the Zoom chat column. And don't forget to write the correct email address because there will be an e-certificate that will be sent to your email. And we would like to say big thank you to our keynote speaker for today, Ms. Pushpa Fagela. It's nice to meet you. And thank you for spending your time to present in our public lecture event. Give precious material about emotional intelligence and answer all questions from the participants. And we want to say thank you to for Women's Mentoring Foundation team and also Clarentia Winta as our moderator for today's public lecture. I also want to say thank you to all participants, including students, educators, and also professionals in Indonesia and from the other countries, such as Australia, India, and Nepal. Thank you for coming to today's public lecture. I hope that the knowledge we received today can be useful for our lives now and our lives in the future. I'm Jessica Lesbasabayan as Master of Ceremony today. For, thank you for joining our event from beginning to the end. Stay healthy and see you next time. Goodbye, have a nice weekend. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pushpa. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pushpa. 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 Thank you, Thank you, God. Thank you, Pak Wisnu, Tia.